recording? Yep, we're all set. Great. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. Uh, as you are all aware, we will be voting on the finalized criteria that will identify disadvantaged communities for the purposes of benefits and investments under the Climate Act. Um, do we move to the next slide? Or do we start the slides? Sorry, I, we just yes, one second. Some technical Hold on. Issues. <laughs> I think all the rooms have had technical issues today, so you'll see my head for anybody who's watching kind of bouncing back and forth because our front camera is no longer working. So I will be trying to face the camera that is working. So apologies if you see the back of my head, that is not a sign of disrespect. It is just me sort of getting acclimated to how things are working. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, for anyone who's observing the proceedings, either live or via WebEx, um, this is a meeting of the Climate Justice Working Group. It is not a public hearing or a public forum. We will not be taking testimony or questions from the public during this meeting. Only Climate Justice Working Group members are permitted to discuss, deliberate, and vote on the finalized criteria. If you are attending, we ask that you remain respectful of these proceedings and refrain from raising your hand, attempting to draw attention, or interjecting at any point. Uh, next. Uh, just and as always, uh, next slide, please. Oh, sorry. If you go back really quickly. Yes. Okay. Um, to reduce noise, as always, um, keep your rooms muted. Uh, raise your hand, please, uh, and we'll unmute your room or raise your hand before speaking. Um, since this meeting is broadcast via WebEx, please say your name before you speak for transcription purposes. And uh, if you are participating uh, via WebEx, uh, please make sure that you have your camera on when you're speaking and your name uh, so folks know who is talking. Uh, next slide. Thanks, Andrea. So we'll go over the agenda. So we're going to start with a roll call. Uh, then we're going to approve the minutes from uh, some of our previous meetings that so they can get put up on the website. Uh, we'll then go into a review of the uh, CLCPA, uh, Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, for those who are not familiar with acronyms. Uh, we will address the voting rules and procedures of the process. Um, we're going to look at the proposed uh, disadvantaged communities uh, criteria summary, where we've been. Uh, we're going to discuss any changes that we've made, and then we'll vote on the uh, proposed criteria, and then we will look at what our next steps will be. Does anybody have any questions or comments, concerns about our agenda before I move forward with the roll call vote? Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, we will have a roll call now. So thank you, everyone. Please remember, again, if you are participating by a video, you need to be on camera with your full name on the screen. Uh, when I call your name, please signify your presence. When I say your name, uh, we'll begin with working group members who are present in fiscal locations. Uh, Sonal Jessel? Here. Jill Hank? Jill, I see you, but I don't hear you. Where is Jill? Do we do I need do we need to unmute? Uh, us she's in Rainbrook. Brooke, if you could unmute. Oh yes. Uh Ray Brooke. There we go. Present. Jill? Can you hear me now? Uh, yes, I can hear you now. Okay. Uh, Abby? Here. Is, uh, does Evon also need to be unmuted? I, I said here. Did you hear me? Oh, there you are. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Rawa? Good afternoon, everyone present. Thank you. Uh, is, is there anyone else in uh, region in the boardroom in New York City? Elizabeth Spurs, DOL. Okay. Uh, Chris? Uh, 
Cole. Chris Cole from Nicerna. Good afternoon. And myself, Olan Kaltucky. I'm also present um, on the video conference. Uh, Elizabeth, up here. Buenos dias, uh, present. Hi, Elizabeth. Uh, Neil. Present. Uh, do we have Eddie? Eddie available on video? Eddie? Hey, folks. Good to see you. Right. Um, Donathan Brown, Dr. Brown, are you on? No? Okay. Uh, Mary Beth McEwen? No? Uh, Amy Klein? Uh, well, we have a physical forum, a quorum present, so we will be able to vote on the minutes uh, and vote on the final criteria. Uh, next slide, please. So, as I said, with the quorum present, as required under open meetings law, we will now take up the minutes from our January 24th, February 9th, and February 16th meetings. Uh, climate Justice Working Group members were provided with the minutes prior to this meeting. Uh, having reviewed the minutes, are there any concerns or additions that need to be made before we vote? Hi, it's Elizabeth Firth. Uh, I'm not listed on the January 24th minutes as present. Okay, we can definitely make sure that that's changed before we publish them. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Any other questions or concerns? Okay, um, I move that uh, to vote the on the Climate Justice Working Group minutes from January 24th, February 9th, and February 16th, uh, with the change that Elizabeth uh, Firth is present on the 24th. Uh, may I have a second, please? I second that. Thank you, Chris. All right, please uh, indicate your approval or disapproval of the minutes by signifying yay or nay when I call your name. And I'll start with uh, Abby. Yay. Chris? Yay. Eddie? Yay. Elizabeth Fur? Yay. Elizabeth Yampier? Yay. Jill? Yay. Neil? Yay. Rawa? Yay. Sonal? Okay. And I also vote in the affirmative. Uh, with that, the minutes from our Climate Justice Working Group meetings from January 24th, February 9th, and February 16th will be approved with the appropriate amendments made to the January 24th meeting. Uh, those minutes will be available on the Climate Justice Working Group website as soon as possible. Uh, next slide, please. So now we will just go into a brief statutory review, um, just discussing the disadvantaged communities criteria, the legislation, and uh, what that all means. Next slide, please. So as we see here, the purpose for establishing the criteria to identify disadvantaged communities is outlined in the Climate Act um, for co-pollutant reductions, greenhouse gas emission reductions, and regulatory impact statements and the allocation of investments and benefits, uh, as seen here um, in the ECL for folks who perhaps didn't know that. Uh, next slide, please. So the 40% benefits goal um, is also stated, and uh, agencies and authorities and entities must, to the extent practicable, uh, invest or direct the 35% with a goal of 40% of the overall benefits for uh, spending to um, uh, and between energy and energy efficiency programs, projects, or investments in uh, housing, workforce development, pollution reduction, low income energy assistance, energy transportation, and economic, economic development um, need to be realized within disadvantaged communities. Uh, next slide, please. So as we see here, uh, disadvantaged communities are communities are defined here in the CLCPA or the Climate Act 
as communities that bear burdens of negative public health, environmental pollution, impacts of climate change, and possess certain socioeconomic criteria or comprise high concentrations of low and moderate uh, income households that are identified based on geographic, public health, environmental hazard, and socioeconomic criteria. Uh, you'll see there at the bottom, they're identified very specifically. Um, areas burdened by cumulative environmental pollution, areas with concentrations of low income, high unemployment, high rent burden, low levels of home ownership, et cetera, and areas vulnerable to climate change, such as flooding, uh, storm surges, and heat island effects. Next slide, please. So now we will discuss the voting uh, process, uh, just sort of outlining it for our vote that will take place uh, later on today. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, before we go through the criteria, uh, here's the voting process. So first, we're going to discuss the disadvantaged communities criteria. So this is going to include a summary of where we've been to this point. Um, we're going to discuss the geographic definition as well as the individual household criteria. Uh, we will also uh, discuss, sorry, there's going to be a summary of the progress that we've made to this point. Um, climate justice working group members may propose changes to the indicators or the methodology for discussion at any point before the vote. Um, we will also, then we'll vote on the criteria, which is going to include the following elements. Um, the 45 indicators, um, how those census tracts were scored, uh, the inclusion of the 35% of census tracts as geographic disadvantaged communities, the inclusion of low-income households anywhere in the state as uh, disadvantaged communities under the criteria, and the definition of low-income households as households at or below 60% of the state moderate median income. Um, additionally, the working group will, at that time, when we uh, do the roll call vote, the working group members will be permitted two minutes to make a statement to explain their vote if they so choose. Nobody is required to, although I'm sure everybody does have something to say at this point. And after the vote is done, we will discuss our next steps. Does anybody have any questions or concerns before we move on? Just in case anybody wonders, I'm not going to be holding a timer with regards to that two minutes. So if you go over, I'm not going to play the Oscars, uh, play you off music. I will, you will be allowed to finish your statement. Next slide, please. So the voting rules uh, are as follows. Open meeting law requires a quorum of working group members to be physically present in publicly accessible locations to proceed. Uh, we have met those quorum requirements. Open meetings law also, uh, the criteria requires a majority of the vote to, uh, of the climate justice working group members to be finalized. So all members will have an equal vote, and this includes agency representatives. And lastly, as I stated a little bit earlier, this will be a roll call vote. So I will call members individually, starting with members present in physical locations. Uh, with all of that said, I will turn things over to Alex to review the proposed criteria. Uh, next slide, please. Oh. Uh, so I'm going to go through a series of slides to kind of give an overview of all the things that we have discussed. But for the first part, I just want to give a quick summary of the disadvantaged community criteria. And that is that for the geographic definition, it includes 45 indicators of environmental exposures, burdens, and climate risks, and social demographic characteristics and health outcomes. Um, the score to score the census tracts on a relative basis, we used a percentile rank and a hierarchical scoring approach. We will go over this in more detail. Um, and we added an environmental climate component by a population health component to get an overall score. In, we include 35% of New York census tracts as geographic DACs, considering each track's relative rank statewide or regionally by New York City versus the rest of the state. And we automatically include tracts that were at least 5% of land is federally recognized as reservation or owned by an Indian nation. On the individual criteria, <clears throat> we include low income households located anywhere in the state of the disadvantaged community communities criteria for the purpose of investing or directing clean energy programs, projects, and investments. 
and we define low income households as households reporting annual total income at or below 60% of state median income. Next slide, please. So the role of the DAC criteria summary language, the criteria descriptions herein are intended to summarize the methods that will be used to identify disadvantaged communities and to facilitate a discussion and voting today. These methodologies, the lists of census tracts, and the maps will be published on the climate.ny.gov website as soon as possible. Next slide, please. And now I'm going to recap the comment review process that we just undertook. Next slide. Much of what we have done and met with to discuss in the past three months have been based on the public comments to the DAC criteria. We started off by organizing over 3,000 comments received and shared and sharing them with the working group. And then we categorized the comments, and reviewed those comments and categorized them with you and prioritize them with you. And based on those comments and discussions during our meetings, the working group identified a set of indicators to explore for potential inclusion. Similarly, based on those comments, the working group discussed different methodological changes to how we would combine indicators, factors, and components together. Through our working group meetings, we explored those methodological changes and found indicators to assess for inclusion. We did a lot of work with all of those comments. Next slide, please. And based on the comments and our discussions, we explored several options to change the criteria. First, we explored several indicators for inclusion in the criteria. And there are some indicators the working group considered where data availability limited our ability to include them, such as diabetes. We'll continue to monitor the feasibility of this and other indicators of interest. Next, we explored factor weighting changes and how component scores were combined. And the working group chose to add component scores together rather than multiply them based on the working group discussions, the comments, and ground truthing. This is the biggest change between the draft criteria and the final criteria you'll be voting on today. Next slide, please. Now let's review what's in the criteria you're voting on today. And full disclosure, I'm going to go through all the details. Um, so much like when you voted on the draft criteria, uh, you're going to see very similar kind of descriptions and explanations. This is meant to guide any final questions you might have before the vote. Next slide. So our approach takes indicators and groups them into component scores. We have two big component scores with factors measuring concepts like the, the, this group identified as critical to identifying DACs. So we've got environmental burdens and climate change risks, and we have population characteristics and health vulnerabilities. Within the environmental burdens component score, we've got po potential pollution exposures factor, land use associated with historical discrimination or disinvestment, potential climate change risks, and 20 indicators that feed into those. Under the population characteristics and health vulnerability, we have income, education, and employment, race, ethnicity, and language, health impacts and burdens, and housing, energy, and communications. And we have 25 indicators that feed into those four different factors. Next slide. I'm not going to read them all, but here are the 20 indicators under the environmental burdens component score. And again, they fall into three different factors. Next slide, please. The population characteristics and health vulnerabilities, these are the 25 different indicators that feed into the four different factors within this component score. Next slide, please. So to get to the final score, we took the percentile ranks of all 45 indicators, and then we weighted certain factors to get two component scores, the environmental burden and population vulnerabilities component scores. And then we add those component scores together. That addition versus multiplication is this major component or change that we made based on the comment period and moving from multiplication to adding them up again. Next slide, please. 
Okay, this is basically saying the same thing, but as in a visual form. In this case, you see the components at the very top, the factors that underlie them. And you see the big plus sign, which we changed from the multiplication sign. Um, and inside of those, you see the factor weights that we created to balance things out. Next slide. Once we have our single score, we end up ranking the scores and taking the top scores for New York City and the rest of the state. So that's how we have combined things. And you will see in the next slide that from there, we take the top 35% of those scores. And that's based on the many discussions the working group had discussed to designate 35% of census tracts. And this results in 1,736 census tracts designated as DAX. Next slide. It was really through a lot of deliberation and research that the working group chose to designate 35% of tracts as DAX. The working group based this decision on several critical factors, first aligning with the benefits of spending, ground truthing, and the inclusion of individual household criteria, and the fact that there is a requirement for a review of the criteria in the future, and that 35% aligns with other benchmarks. Please tell me, I'm zooming through, assuming that you don't want to read all the minutia on this, but I do want to have it on the slide if you want to through it, so tell me if I'm going too fast. With that, next slide. So this is the designation overview of our approach because it is a little bit more complex than just taking those top percentile ranks um, scores. There are a couple special cases, the census tracts that we treat differently. There are 138 tracts that don't have enough population data to calculate a population vulnerability scores. So we're scoring those only based on the environmental burdens. There are also 19 tracks that are indigenous and tribal areas, and these are automatically included as DACs. Next slide, please. For completeness, this is the detail of the criteria. Again, we automatically include the 19 census tracts that are federally designated as reservation territory or state recognized nation owned land. Then we use the census tracts overall scores multiplying or adding. Oops. There's a typo in here, so it's adding the environmental climate component with a population health characters component. And then we calculate the percentile rank in statewide and regionally. Then we select the census tracts that score the top 28.9 of their regional or statewide per wide percentages. Combined, that creates a th top 35% of tracts that are designated. Then for the tracks that have few census designed, defined households and populations, that's less than 300 households or less than 500 people in that census tract. We look at their environmental burdens and climate change risk scores and see if they are in the top 28.9% of their regional or state led rank and include them if they are. And then we exclude census tracts that have less than 100 people from scoring altogether, unless they are indigenous or tribal areas. Next slide, please. So this is a visual version of the same thing, showing that the take the 29 top 29 percent of the regional scores and the statewide scores, and that ends up with 35 percent designated across the state. Next slide, please. There are 19 census tracts that were automatically included in the criteria. We respect the sovereignty of the indigenous nations that share boundaries with New York State and have reached out to nation leadership and representatives with the offer of consultation on DACs and have presented on the proposed criteria with nation representatives at annual Indian nation leadership meetings. We will continue to offer opportunities to consult on these issues if nation leadership or representatives determine consultation is needed. Next slide, please. Now we're going to skip ahead. I'm going to go through this very briefly because we already talked about it, but there are 138 tracks that had too low of population counts for us to manage to include the demographic, social demographic component. Um, 
<clears throat> 64 of those tracks actually had zero population. So of these 138, there were only 85, um, or yeah, there were only 85 that we could really include. And of them, the remaining 53 tracks had, with at least 100 people, they were scored only on their environmental and climate burdens uh, score alone. So this adds about 12 tracks to the lo with low household counts to the DAC definition. Next slide, please. So that was the geographic definition, and now I'm going to add the criteria for the individual um, elements of it. After a lot of discussion, the working group decided to include individual criteria for the purpose of investing or directing clean energy and energy efficiency programs. Next slide, please. The working group discussed several individual criteria, but settled on using at or below 60% of state median income because it aligns with publicly administered programs. And that was the blazing flat fast review of everything that we have discussed uh, with a working group and the comment period. And so now I'm going to hand it back to Alana for a vote. I'm happy to field any questions as well. Does anybody have any comments, questions, or concerns before we move forward with the vote? All right, uh, with the review of the materials complete, I will call for a vote on the final criteria for identifying disadvantaged communities as, as defined by the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. Uh, as a reminder, all members of the Climate Justice Working Group will have one vote uh, on the final criteria, and it will, it will signify their approval or disapproval with a yay or nay when called. Climate Justice Working Group members will have two minutes to explain their vote at that time if they so choose. I will start with uh, working group members who are present in fiscal location, starting with uh, Sonal Jessel. Thank you all. I am voting yes on this definition. And that is because, you know, I feel confident that we have gone through all of the public comments that came to us and really seriously evaluated everything. And while we weren't able to fill in all gaps because of maybe data being incomplete, whatever reasons they were, I think that we did really great due diligence moving through all of the concerns that came in. Um, and then secondly, I would say, I think it's an important point to emphasize that this is uh, the, the map might change in the future as new data rolls in, such as the diabetes statistics that we don't have. Um, there's a lot of data on extreme heat that's hard to capture. So as we become better at that as a, as a state, like the lead service lines, I think that that will also be important to add in the future when we as a climate justice working group come back together to um, continue to shape the map as needed. So um, with those considerations, I vote yes. Thank you, Sonal. Uh, Abby, keep your thought. Hi, thanks. Um, so I also will vote to approve the criteria as they currently stand. Um, and would largely echo Sonal's comments. Um, it's really been quite an honor to be part of this process. I think going into it, none of us quite knew what to expect, um, but I, I've certainly learned a lot through it, and it's given me the opportunity to understand and appreciate the challenges in defining exactly what a disadvantaged community is. So although uh, the criteria that we've come up with are not perfect in every way, I do feel confident that we have done the best that we could have done best, uh, based on the available data. Um, and speaking of the data, you know, there will is a clear need for better measurement and tracking of climate and pollution impact related data. Um, so I would definitely encourage the state to prioritize that um, in a, a, the most transparent way possible moving forward. Um, of course, we will need to come together and regularly review and refine the criteria 
over the coming years, and I do look forward to engaging in that process with you all to make sure that our DAC designation achieves what we need it to achieve. Um, and then really, though, the sec success depends on how it is implemented, uh, specifically around how benefits and investments are assessed. So I appreciate the work that the state agencies have already done in that regard to define exactly what qualifies as benefits and investment. Um, your process has clearly been robust and comprehensive and thoughtful so far, uh, and continuing to uphold that um, is something that I think, you know, I know I see as a, a priority and again, look forward to over the, the coming years, just making sure that it is playing out as we had all intended. Um, so again, thank you for being, uh, you know, including me in this process and for everyone who has been part of it. Alex, you and your team have been super awesome. Um, Alana and Chris, thank you for leading us and just all my fellow Climate Justice Working Group members, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Abby. Uh, Jill, hey. You're gonna ask me to follow Abby. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I am also going to vote yes on this criteria and echo everything that Abby um, and Sonal just said. And this has been a, a really uh, educational process for me. I am appreciative to have been able to represent the rural areas of New York State. This is a, obviously a statewide criteria and my fellow members and uh, everybody involved in this process has been really cognizant of the fact that we are a very uh, unique state in that we have New York City and then we also have the remote areas where I live and where our stakeholders live. So I, I really appreciate that thoughtful representation. And um, the point that Abby made about the data, I'm really curious to see how our definition evolves as the data improves. Um, and I'm also, as a person who works on implementing a lot of these statewide programs, really excited to see the functionality of the uh, DSC criteria in real life. And I'm grateful that this is going to be an iterative process and that I'll be able to contribute um, my firsthand anecdotal knowledge to that process. So thank you all um, and I'm voting yes. Thank you, Joe. Rawa Gramatian, did I say that right? Alana, you did great, Gramatian, very good. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, hello, everyone. Really uh, echoing uh, all of the sentiments um, of the Climate Justice Working Group and other folks that have already spoken. Uh, I really do want to thank, it's so important to me to thank, um, in particular, the DEC and NYSERDA staff, Alana, Chris, Adriana, you've been great. Dr. Alex Dunn and the Loom team, um, thank you so much for, all, for the special care you took with us in coming up with this really challenging uh, criteria definitions and all the tools that you introduced us to. Um, climate justice working group colleagues, y'all are amazing and I'm always learning from you. Um, I want to say that, you know, I am actually proud uh, of the work that we've accomplished over the last three years. It definitely has come with a lot of challenges, but I think in, um, you know, really getting to know each other more deeply, uh, centering EJ, CJ concerns, really listening to us. Uh, even if the you know ability to collect the data is not quite there, that this is going to be iterative, um, was has been worth all of the challenges and the time that we spent. Of course, having said that, I think it's really important to also uplift that you know one of the things that I don't think we did a great job in is bringing indigenous and tribal nation leaders to uh, speak to the climate justice working group members in person um, and. We can't call ourselves EJ, those of us on the front lines, and not stand in solidarity with our indigenous brothers and sisters. So I really do want to read a statement that was um, sent to me by the um, Kanawanda Seneca Nation, um, which is part of the Haudenosaunee uh, in, in New York State. Um, and, you know, I think they have a major concern, in particular, the Tanawanda Seneca Nation around industrialization that's adjacent to its treaty recognized reservation territory and the need for the CLCPA analysis to be conducted in ways that acknowledge and protect the nation's special relationship with the land and the natural world. Um, as a traditional 
Haudenosaunee Nation, the Tonawanda Seneca Nation rejects the idea that destruction of its territory can be offset by benefits provided by the state or a developer. The direct, indirect, and cumulative impacts of industrial development on the nation, its cultural resources, and its environment cannot be counterbalanced by economic development, financial support, jobs, or other forms of monetary financial benefit. Instead, if the, if the state wishes to begin to address the legacy of colonialism and dispossession on the Haudenosaunee, these damaging impacts must be avoided altogether. As the nation has put it, the nation is still here. Our culture and people are thriving despite hundreds of years of efforts by outsiders to destroy us. And our, net, and our cultural resources, including living creatures, the waters, the air, and the plants on and around our territory. There was a letter that was dated February 2nd, 2023 to Genesee Economic Development Corporation. This means that as the indigenous nations, the CLCPA's requirements with respect to disadvantaged communities must take account of the holistic effects of industrial pro projects in creating disproportionate burdens on the nations. For example, to prioritize reductions in green ga greenhouse gas emissions impacting the nation as required by the CLCPA. The state should prohibit industrialization of non-industrial lands adjacent to indigenous nation territories where the nations in question oppose them. To prevent disproportionate burdens as required by CLCPA, the state should prevent destruction of habitat and degradation of the environment on and near Indian nations. I'm almost finished. In December 2022, the Nation's Council of Chiefs wrote to U.S. Secretary of Interior Deb Haaland about the grave environmental threats facing the nation and stated the nation objects to the industrial manufacturing projects proposed to be cited adjacent to the nation. We do not want our territory, people, or future generations to be burdened by the negative impacts of these projects, particularly since no studies have been conducted to determine the scope of these impacts. This remains true despite the CLCPA's guarantees. As the nation stated uh, by a letter to DEC Commissioner Sagos in March 2023, industrial development at SAMP threatens our waters, our wildlife, our big woods, and our future generations. Whatever the benefits of that industrial development, the Tonawanda Seneca Nation, which lies adjacent to and downstream from the site, will bear the burdens. We demand that environment, environmental justice be considered and our rights protected. I really do hope by bringing, you know, uh, this statement into this space that as we continue as a climate justice working group to um, assess on an annual basis the impact of um, the DAC criteria that we've created uh, and the improvements that are happening in our communities, that there are ways to bring um, indigenous voices themselves. I don't like speaking for other people and I don't like for people to speak for me, um, really into this space to figure out a way where we can actually talk to one another and ensure that the true intention um, of addressing these issues at their core is able to be met. Thank you. And I vote yes. Thank you, Rawa. Uh, next, I will move to uh, Elizabeth Young here. Elizabeth? I vote yes. Um, I I do. Well, thank you for that, Rawa. Um, I, that was a, a tremendous important, a tremendously important uh, foundation for the discussions that we've had uh, for the last two years. Um, first, I I want to echo everything that Rawa said in thanking uh, the DEC staff uh, and those of you who helped uh, staff us as we spent hours and hours trying to deliberate. On, um, on how we would come to this. Um, those of us who were born and raised in EJ communities um, always come into these conversations with a lot of heaviness uh, because we wanna make sure that no one is left out. And those of us who are from New York City are always concerned that given our population that we won't be um, properly represented. But um, what was a wonderful surprise was that this working group was uh, just and deeply committed to a process that made it possible for us to build alignment. And I, uh, who always come in with the idea of that I have to be guarded because I don't know where uh, the resistance is gonna come from in terms of justice, uh, was able, was disarmed by uh, a process that I thought was really respectful 
uh, relentless um, and, uh, and, and dedicated to centering racial justice and equity. Um, so it was really a positive process. I do want to say that uh, for something to be environmental justice, um, it means that those communities that have had a legacy of environmental harm also have to then benefit and have a legacy of environmental benefits. And so that is the only way that we're going to level the playing field. Um, I am disappointed uh, about um, uh, the exclusion of diabetes and it not being central uh, to this because, um, you know, as I said, you know, I was born and raised in EJ communities and uh, I am in a community where a good number of the Latino children um, have diabetes and, um, and it is an EJ issue. It's not something that, um, something that comes from a legacy of, of extraction and a legacy of environmental harm and a legacy of, of racism. And so uh, the fact that the, sta the, statistics, the statistics weren't there uh, to include that also speaks to gaps that exist in governance um, that um, make it impossible to address um, the concerns in our communities. Um, but um, in terms of this process, in terms of the recommendations that we've made, uh, they came from a lot of deliberations, a lot of hard and IVS. Thank you, Elizabeth. Eddie Batista. Hey all, uh, I, I uh, also vote yes. And um, uh, in my explanation before I uh, uh, lean in, I just wanted to associate myself with all the comments uh, from my climate justice working group fellow members. Um, it's been uh, it's, it's been a long couple of years um, in more ways than one, um, but it has been it's testament I think to the goodwill and the sobriety that everyone approached this task with. Um, I think we all get uh, the period of time we're living in, and we all we all understand um, that you know, of course, climate change will affect everyone, but its impacts are not evenly felt. And this is a big step uh, to trying to rectify that. Um, I, I will say, uh, let me just uh, before I get to the big picture, talk local picture a little bit. Um, uh, I'm also really proud of how we um, not only tried to, uh, you know, the, 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 one of the guiding lines of ours was leave no DAC behind. I think we went. Uh, so far as to um, ensure that individual households and rapidly gentrifying communities would also be captured, um, uh, which I, I, a lot of us were afraid would would not be so. Um, from a local perspective, um, those communities that feel like they've been uh, uh, left behind, if they feel like um, you know there's a DAC right across the street from me, um, we we get it, and I think that it's important for all of us to remember that. Um, this was ne this was oh there was always going to be a level of imprecision built into this, um, not the least of which is if we don't have um, all the data points that we need to capture all the vulnerabilities. Um, by definition, it, it's going to mean that uh, it, you know the the reach will be imprecise. Um, so I would urge groups uh, to not not be um, overly frustrated. This these DAC criteria apply again to 35 to 40 percent, which means that 60 to 65 percent of clean energy uh, revenues are still there and are still up for grabs. Uh, I would say to folks, um, if you are adjacent to a DAC and feel like there was uh, a certain amount of um, uh, uh, just um, automation, if you will, <laughs> built into whether or not you're in a DAC or not, I would urge you all when you do apply for your clean energy and energy efficiency funding, mention that to regulators, right? I think uh, we all would hope at the end of the day that bureaucracy doesn't trump humanity and that people, uh, and I think that our uh, colleagues at the state level will do their level best uh, to try to uh, ensure that even if you're not in the DAC, that, that attention gets paid to your community. Um, again, also want to uh, just deeply thank DEC, NYSERDA, and Alum. And finally, uh, from a big picture perspective, I mean, I think, uh, a lot of us went into this literally years ago, hoping to arrive at exactly this moment uh, where there's recognition by the state that there has been um, a, a, a differential quality to how people uh, have lived in this state. And the fact that we have all collectively leaned in to try to begin to address some of those disparities um, should be heartening to everyone. Uh, and last pick, my last point about the big picture is uh, there's still big picture decisions ahead of us. Um, 
uh, especially for our agency friends, for those of you who are uh, uh, leaning in and working and thinking about how a cap and invest program could work. I, I urge you all to please pay attention to uh, the comments that will be coming from New York News and our allies. Um, it's, it, it would be the height of absurdity if after, after two years we developed that criteria and the state turns around and develops a cap and invest program that allows trading that allows uh, uh, you know, the bankrolling of allowances and therefore, by extension, uh, the, perpetua the perpetuation of hotspots, which, again, was the whole purpose of this exercise was to reduce those. Um, so we urge our colleagues in the state to be mindful of this uh, and not to replicate disparities as they think about a cap and invest system uh, that's fair and equitable. I vote yes. And uh, again, congratulations and thanks to my, the rest of the working group members. Thank you, Eddie. Chris Cole. Yep, thanks, Alana. So uh, I also vote yes to uh, to approve and move forward the uh, criteria. Um, but I also want to just take a minute and thank um, my fellow Climate Justice Working Group uh, members. So, you know, it's obvious that throughout this process, you've um, you know you're committed to kind of getting getting us and getting the state to a place where we are actually able to realize the you know, the climate justice goals of, of the Climate Act. Um, so everything from your diligence in, in assessing the data, so going from the 170 or so indicators that we started with to the countless data points that we had to kind of, you know, work through and assess, um, asking the tough questions, right? So I think a number of you have flagged, you know, these have been really, really productive, um, you know, climate justice working group meetings that we've had over the last several, last couple of years. Um, and then ultimately landing on the set of criteria that we can we can actually move forward and um, you know, start to deliver on the objectives of the Climate Act. Um, I also want to just thank the members of the public. So a lot of our community partners who you know have spent the time to kind of you know follow the process, to engage in the process, and to submit comments. Um, so you know over 3,000 comments, right? So Alex had done that kind of review earlier. Um, so, you know, again, appreciate the, the engagement and the, the, the participation of members of the public. And then obviously to our team for, you know, doing all the work behind the scenes, you know, every uh, working group meeting, every, um, every, set, every analysis that we have to develop to support the, the work of the Climate Justice Working Group is, you know, led and supported by a number of team members from across the DEC and I service. So I want to thank everyone for their hard work getting us to this point. So. With that, I agree, yes. Thank you, Chris. Elizabeth Burke? Uh, um, I'm also voting yes. Um, and I'm reading a quote from Labor. Uh, this vote is a major step toward ensuring that disadvantaged communities throughout New York State can realize the many benefits stemming from our transition to a green economy. We now have a tangible way to address climate injustices of the past. This was a long but fruitful process, and I'd like to thank NYSERDA, DEC, ALUM, the entire climate justice working group, uh, and the many researchers, advocates, and members of the public who took the time to provide input, input on this critical issue. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, Neil Muscatello? Muscatello? Sorry. It's okay. Hi. Thanks, Alana. Um, yeah, I would just say um, thanks for the opportunity to be part of the process. I know that um, I learned a lot uh, being part of these meetings. I recognize the, the limitations and gaps that, um, you know, we, we, we had in some of the data. Um, I think this also sort of drove some work on that. And I can say that, uh, you know, moving forward, there will be diabetes data. We, for example, we um, did provide a, a, an initial layer for the Loom team to look at. So that will be um, part of the next um, update. Um, so um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say that and then happy just to say um, I approve the, uh, the current criteria and look forward to um, continued discussions in the future. Thank you, Neil. Uh, and I guess that just leaves me. Uh, I also vote in the affirmative. Um, when, uh, I will say that when, uh, for folks who remember when we began this process, I was not the chair of the Climate Justice Working Group. 
I was the WebEx troll in the background uh, addressing uh, issues. Um, and Rosa Mendez, uh, my previous former fearless leader, was in charge. So I definitely want to make sure that as we uh, finalize this process, we are remembering all of the hard work and dedication uh, of Rosa Mendez. She did an amazing job. She was an amazing leader. She is very much missed. And uh, we'll definitely be making sure that she knows that we finalized the criteria. And I'm sure that she uh, feels an extreme sense of pride in everybody who participated in this process. Uh, as the uh, chair of the Climate Justice Working Group, uh, I will say that when, uh, I would like to thank everybody, basically, uh, for their dedication to this work. Um, a lot has changed since our first meeting, uh, so it really does feel like it is a completely different time. Um, and, uh, you know, 2020, August 2020 is when we had our first meeting, and so it really does feel as if it was just everything just completely changed. Um, and to be frank, you know, the, the mask mandates and the social distancing didn't really bother me as much because I'm a somewhat introverted person. So I like masks and I like being away from other people. Uh, but what did bother me uh, was witnessing how marginalized and low income communities of color were disproportionately impacted during the pandemic. And what didn't agree with me at all were uh, cynical pedants who were determined to lay the blame uh, on the victims rather than admitting that we were dealing with generations of redlining, uh, income inequality, and malicious zoning practices, and that those practices were finally bearing fruit, and we were seeing those results. So I'm personally uh, extremely proud to have been a part of this process and to have spent the last almost three full years working with a group of people who did not create this problem, but are more than willing to stand up, uh, regardless of the pushback and the criticism, and to fix the thing that they did not break. So I extend uh, just tremendous gratitude, hearty thank you to the working group, to our absolutely incredible consultants at Illum, to our staff members. Tyler Picard deserves a special round of applause. Um, to uh, Haley Perros back here, here you can't see her, but she's here. Uh, Adriana Spinoza, uh, everyone who has worked on this, folks who worked in the background, um, you guys are all my heroes, uh, even when you frustrated me. So uh, I know that this process <laughs> wasn't always easy, but we really have completed an extremely important step. And uh, even though there are miles to go before we sleep, uh, I think that this moment really does deserve uh, congratulations. So you all deserve a round of applause. Uh, you can all have sort of a virtual hug because I don't do live ones. Uh, <laughs> so thank you very much to everybody and I vote in the affirmative. So, and while we have a moment, just another a thanks to Alana for, for leading us through this you know, last has it been two years? Two years yeah, two years. So thanks a lot for your your efforts and uh, keeping keeping us on on task. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Um, with all that being said, we're not done yet. Uh, <laughs> we do have a meeting on April fourth. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> yes, we will. We will see each other again very very soon. Um, for folks who are observing, uh, we will have our next climate justice working group meeting on April 4th at 12 p.m. Uh, we will be sending around an advisory very soon. I don't want to spoil any uh, happy moments that were happening. Uh, sorry, next slide. <laughs> That's my oh. I don't want to uh, destroy any sort of happy moments. But um, so uh, because you know we don't get to take a, a rest really or a break, uh, we're just we're going to jump right into our next steps. Um, oh, sorry, uh, Adrian is reminding me. Have we confirmed that the vote has passed? Yes, it has. The vote, <laughs> uh, the vote, the Climate Justice Working Group has voted to finalize the disadvantaged communities criteria. Look at me, getting all caught up and moving to our next meeting. I forgot to certify that we have voted in favor of finalizing the disadvantaged communities criteria, um, and definition for which we will then uh, steer benefits and investments to communities. So again, congratulations to everybody. Thank you. Now, next steps. Um, so we do have about two uh, categories of activities that we're going to work through. 
Um, we want to operationalize the final criteria. I don't think yeah, operationalize the final criteria. So we're going to spend some time at our next meeting, which will be uh, April 4th at 12 p.m. And we're going to discuss this. Um, then you're going to just sort of outline what we need to focus on in the coming weeks, um, just to make sure that we get the, to sort of implement that criteria. So uh, we're going to have a press release that's going to go out later today. It's going to let everybody know uh, the work that we've done here. Um, we're going to update the fact sheets um, to make sure that just like before the draft fact sheets, these fact sheets are also translated. Uh, we are going to have a list of dis designated communities will be available on the website as well as shape files for folks to download those layers. Um, we will be updating the interactive map. Um, in the meantime, we will have some maps available for folks that are in HTML so people can scroll in and scroll out. Um, they're going to be uh, regional, so folks will be able to uh, select their region and be able to scroll in and scroll out in different, different, uh, different uh, identified communities. And we will be working on a final report um, just to make sure that we have everything addressed, including how we address the comments. So all of this information is going to be made available as soon as practicable. Um, Additionally, DEC is going to be communicating with other agencies about the criteria has been finalized, and they should start to use that immediately, if not sooner. And we will also be working on guidance to agencies on reporting on the clean energy and energy efficiency investments within the DACs. Uh, so we're going to make sure that there is something for folks to review and make sure that we're being very transparent in that process. And then we'll also talk about the, uh, the annual review of the criteria. So, as uh, noted, the criteria do need to be reviewed as we move forward. So, this means that we're going to monitor what's been done in other areas, um, consider, oh, sorry, yes, yeah, sorry, <laughs> uh, next slide, um, consider updates to the data as needed, and uh, make recommendations for potential changes to the indicators and or, or the methodologies, such as adding data sets on diabetes, just as we discussed. So as part of that review, we're going to need to assess the criteria with an eye towards how the DAC provisions are being implemented. So we're definitely going to be discussing this on April 4th. Uh, so uh, come prepared to vote on the minutes from this meeting and to actually, I don't think, well, hopefully we'll have uh, enough time for you guys to review the minutes um, and to discuss uh, how we see this process uh, moving forward, playing out moving forward. Uh, Eddie, do you have one? Yeah, hi, Alana. A quick question. So, uh, just out of curiosity, um, uh, some of us may be traveling for the next meeting. Um, am I hearing that the only uh, action item for the next meeting is approving the minutes? So, if there are quorum issues, uh, that's the only thing that will be uh, delayed, or are there other action items expected? Uh, no, that's the only thing that we would be sort of technically voting on. So I, it's we. Well, if if we don't get them done on the board, they will eventually get done. <laughs> okay. Um, are there any other questions, comments, or concerns? I'm sorry. Next slide, please. Any questions? I can't raise comments? my hand. Oh, there. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Well, we'll give you the um, microphone. So I know you mentioned that the HTML links for the maps and the updated, I'm assuming the DEC info locator map will be um, available as soon as practical. I've already had mm -hmm. people ask me when they can access this information. Do you have anything more specific than as soon as practical or, or as soon as possible that I could relay to them? Well, considering that we had multiple technical issues today, I can make no promises. <laughs> on how everything will work out, but the goal is to have all of that up within the next 48 hours. Um, there are some items, obviously, that are going to take a little bit longer. Um, updating the Tableau, the interactive Tableau map, it's going to take a bit longer. The final report is going to take a little bit longer, and the fact sheets, um, we will have the um, English version of the fact sheet available um, almost immediately, but the translations do take a little time to do, so those uh, will take a little bit of time rather than being up immediately, but um, the, we should, within the next 48 hours, um, have those HTML maps and the shape files available and uh, some updates made to the website. Great, thank you.
Any other questions or comments? Apologies, my head keeps having to turn in different directions because. <laughs> Alana, said, I, I want, hi, sorry, Alana. Um, it, it, would sure. you guys be able to uh, send around the um, uh, the um, PowerPoint slides from today for the uh, working oh. group? Absolutely. And 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 one line, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask uh, uh, if I could get mine signed by Basil. I just curious, how is anybody any word on how, our friend Basil how he's doing? Where is Basil today? I don't know. He's doing well. He is out of the country right now, or he would be here uh, himself. Uh, but I have you know a message to, from him to uh, you know to uh, appreciation of your dedication uh, from the climate justice working group members over the last few years. Just want to extend uh, thank you and gratitude on behalf of Commissioner Segos and Governor Hochul. Um, your contribution to the state of New York during this process has been incredibly meaningful and will benefit New Yorkers for many years to come. Uh, so uh, again, on behalf of the commissioner, just thanks to you and your service to the state and to New Yorkinos um, across the entire state. So he couldn't be here with us, but he wished his, he was. Folks, Adriana and I did not plan this. That, that... I had no idea there will be a Basil statement ready to go. But I was uh, give, ready. <laughs> give him my best when you guys see him and uh, uh, just hoping he, he comes back okay. Well, I was going to close with that, but now that I can't, now that's already been said, <laughs> thus proving that nothing is planned ahead of time <laughs> on things like that. Um, okay, everyone, uh, next slide, please. Thank you, uh, everyone, for all of your hard work, all of your dedication. Uh, as Adriana said, thank you on behalf of Commissioner Segos. Thank you on behalf of Governor Kathy Hochul, uh, on behalf of DEC, on behalf of NYSERDA. Uh, thank you so much for all of your hard work, your dedication, your advocacy. It has been truly inspiring to be a part of this process. Um, and I will see you all uh, next week. <laughs> to talk thank you about to our chair. Thank you to you, Thank Alana, you. for everything you've done. Thank you, Alana. Appreciate you. Thank you, everyone. And as always, if you guys have any questions, uh, comments, concerns, feel free to reach out to me. Um, but otherwise, I will see you all next week. Look forward to talking to you. Thank you, everyone. Congratulations. Everybody have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Bye.